warning of the giant crab and other tales from old india this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales the giant crab and other tales from old india retold by w h d rouse warning to the studious or scientific reader i hope no one will imagine this to be a scientific book it is meant to amuse children and if it succeeds in this its aim will be hit thus the stories here given although grounded upon the great buddhist collection named below have been ruthlessly altered wherever this would better suit them for the purpose in view and probably some of them buddha himself would fail to recognize my thanks are due to the syndics of the cambridge university press for permitting the use of their translation of the jataka book from which comes the groundwork of the stories and occasionally a phrase or a versicle is borrowed to this work i refer all scholars folklorists and scientific persons generally warning them that if they plunge deeper into these pages they will be horribly shocked End of the warning. Part one of the Giant Crab and Other Tales from Old India, retold by W. H. D. Rouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part one: The Giant Crab, the Hypocritical Cat, the Crocodile and the Monkey, the Axe, the Drum, the Bowl, and the Diamond the giant crab once upon a time there was a lake in the mountains and in that lake lived a huge crab i dare say you have often seen crabs boiled and put on a dish for you to eat and perhaps at the seaside you have watched them sidling away at the bottom of a pool sometimes a boy or girl bathing in the sea gets a nip from a crab and then there is squeaking and squealing but our crab was much larger than these he was the largest crab ever heard of he was bigger than a dining-room table and his claws were as big as an armchair fancy what it must be to have a nip from such claws as those well this huge crab lived all alone in the lake now the different animals that lived in the wild mountains used to come to that lake to drink deer and antelopes foxes and wolves lions and tigers and elephants and whenever they came into the water to drink the great crab was on the watch and one of them at least never went up out of the water again the crab used to nip it with one of his huge claws and pull it under and then the poor beast was drowned and made a fine dinner for the big crab this went on for a long time and the crab grew bigger and bigger every day fattening on the animals that came there to drink so at last all the animals were afraid to go near that lake this was a pity because there was very little water in the mountains and the creatures did not know what to do when they were thirsty at last a great elephant made up his mind to put an end to the crab and his doings so he and his wife agreed that they would lead a herd of elephants there to drink and while the other elephants were drinking they would look out for the crab they did as they arranged when the herd of elephants got to the lake these two went in first and kept farthest out in the water watching for the crab and the others drank and trumpeted and washed themselves close in shore soon they had had enough and began to go out of the water and then sure enough the elephant felt a tremendous nip on the leg the crab had crawled up under the water and got him fast he nodded to his wife who bravely stayed by his side and then she began dear mr crab she said please let my husband go the crab poked his eyes out of the water you know a crab's eyes grow on a kind of little stalk and this crab was so big that his eyes looked like two thick tree trunks with a cannon-ball on the top of each now this crab was a great flirt or rather he used to be a great flirt but lately he had nobody to flirt with because he had eaten up all the creatures that came near him and mrs elephant was a beautiful elephant with a shiny brown skin and elegant flapping ears and a curly trunk 
and two white tusks that twinkled when she smiled so when the big crab saw this beautiful elephant he thought he would like to have a kiss and he said in a wheedling tone dear little elephant will you give me a kiss then mrs elephant pretended to be very pleased and put her head on one side and flapped her tail and she looked so sweet and so tempting that the crab let go the other elephant and began to crawl slowly towards her waving his eyes about as he went all this while mr elephant had been in great pain from the nip of the crab's claw but he had said nothing for he was a very brave elephant but he did not mean to let his wife come to any harm not he it was all part of their trick and as soon as he felt his leg free he trumpeted loud and long and jumped right upon the crab's back crack crack went the crab's shell for big as he was an elephant was too heavy for him to carry crack 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 the elephant jumped up and down on his back and in a very short time the crab was crushed to mincemeat. What rejoicing there was among the animals when they saw the crab crushed to death! From far and near they came, and passed a vote of thanks to the elephant and his wife, and made them king and queen of all the animals in the mountains. As for the crab, there was nothing left of him but his claws, which were so hard that nothing could even crack them, so they were left in the pool and in the autumn there came a great flood and carried the claws down into the river and the river carried them hundreds of miles away to a great city where the king's sons found them and made out of them two immense drums which they always beat when they go to war and the very sound of these drums is enough to frighten the enemy away the hypocritical cat once upon a time there was a troop of rats that used to live in holes by a riverside a certain cat often saw them going to and fro and longed to have them to eat but he was not strong enough to attack them altogether besides that would not have suited his purpose because most of them would have run away so he used to stand early in the morning not far from their holes with his face towards the sun snuffing up the air and standing on one leg the rats wondered why he did that, so one day they all trooped up to him in a body and asked the reason. "'What is your name, sir?' they began. "'Holy is my name,' said the cat. "'Why do you stand on one leg?' "'Because if I stood on all four, the earth would not bear my weight.' "'And why do you keep your mouth open?' "'Because I feed on the air and never eat anything else.' "'And why do you face the sun?' because i worship the sun what a pious cat the rats all thought ever after that when they started out in the morning they did not fail first to make their bow to the cat one by one and to show thus their respect for his piety this was just what our cat wanted every day as they filed past he waited till the tail of the string came up and then like lightning pounced upon the hindmost and gobbled him up in a trice after which he stood on one leg as before licking his lips greedily for a while all went well for the cat's plan but at last the chief of the rats noticed that the troop seemed to grow smaller here and there he missed some familiar face he could not make it out but at last a thought came into his mind that perhaps the pious cat might know more about it than he chose to tell next day accordingly he posted himself at the tail of the troop where he could see everything that went on and as the rats one by one bowed before the cat he watched the cat out of the end of his eye as he came up the cat prepared for his pounce but our rat was ready for him and dodged out of the way aha says the rat so that is your piety feeds on the air does he and worships the sun eh? what a humbug and with one spring he was at the cat's throat and his sharp teeth fast the other rats heard the scuffle and came trooping back and it was crunch and munch till not a vestige remained of the hypocritical cat those who came first had cat to eat and those who came last went sniffing about at the mouths of their friends and asking what was the taste of cat's meat 
and ever after the rats lived in peace and happiness the crocodile and the monkey once upon a time there was a deep and wide river and in this river lived a crocodile i do not know whether you have ever seen a crocodile but if you did see one i am sure you would be frightened they are very long twice as long as your bed and they are covered with hard green or yellow scales and they have a wide flat snout and a huge jaw with hundreds of sharp teeth so big that it could hold you all at once inside it this crocodile used to lie all day in the mud half under water basking in the sun and never moving but if any little animal came near he would jump up and open his big jaws and snap it up as a dog snaps up a fly and if you had gone near him he would have snapped you up too just as easily on the bank of this river lived a monkey he spent the day climbing about the trees and eating nuts or wild fruit but he had been there so long that there was hardly any fruit left upon the trees now it so happened that the crocodile's wife cast a longing eye on this monkey she was very dainty in her eating was mrs crocodile and she liked the titbits so one morning she began to cry crocodile's tears are very big and as her tears dropped into the water splash 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 mr crocodile woke up from his snooze and looked round to see what was the matter why wife said he what are you crying about i'm hungry whimpered mrs crocodile all right said he wait a minute i'll soon get you something but i want that monkey's heart said mrs crocodile splash 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 went her tears again come come cheer up said mr crocodile he was very fond of his wife and he would have wiped away her tears only he had no pocket handkerchief cheer up said he i'll see what i can do his wife dried her tears and mr crocodile lay down again on the mud thinking he thought for a whole hour you see though he was very big he was very stupid at last he heaved a sigh of relief for he thought that he had hit upon a clever plan he wallowed along the bank to a place just underneath a big tree up on the tree our monkey was swinging by his tail and chattering to himself monkey he called out in the softest voice he could manage it was not very soft something like a policeman's rattle but it was the best he could do with all those sharp teeth the monkey stopped swinging and looked down the crocodile had never spoken to him before and he felt rather surprised monkey dear called the crocodile again well what is it asked the monkey i'm sure you must be hungry said mr crocodile i see you have eaten all the fruit on these trees but why don't you try the trees on the other side of the river just look apples pears quinces plums anything you could wish for and heaps of them oh that is all very well said the monkey but how can i get across a wide river like this oh said the cunning crocodile that is easily managed i like your looks and i want to do you a good turn jump on my back and i'll swim across then you can enjoy yourself never had the monkey had an offer so tempting he swung round a branch three times in his joy his eyes glistened and without thinking a moment down he jumped on the crocodile's back the crocodile began to swim slowly across the monkey fixed his eyes on the opposite bank with its glorious fruit trees and danced for joy suddenly he felt the water about his feet it rose to his legs it rose to his middle the crocodile was sinking mr crocodile mr crocodile take care said he you'll drown me ah laughed the crocodile snapping his great jaws so you thought i was taking you across out of pure good nature you are a green monkey to be sure the truth is my wife has taken a fancy to you and wants your heart to eat if you had seen her crying this morning i am sure you would have pitied her what a good thing you told me said the monkey he was a very clever monkey and had his wits about him wait a bit and i'll tell you why my heart i think you said 
why i never carry my heart inside me that would be too dangerous if we monkeys went jumping about the trees with our hearts inside we should knock them to bits in no time the crocodile rose up to the surface again he felt very glad he had not drowned the monkey because as i said he was a stupid creature and did not see that the monkey was playing him a trick oh said he where is your heart then do you see that cluster of round things up in the tree there on the further bank those are our hearts all in a bunch and pretty safe too at that height i should hope it was really a fig tree and certainly the figs did look very much like a bunch of hearts just you take me across he went on and i'll climb up and drop my heart down i can do very well without it you excellent creature said the crocodile so i will and he swam across the river the monkey leapt lightly off the crocodile's back and swung himself up the fig tree there he sat down on a branch and began to eat the figs with great enjoyment your heart please called out the crocodile can't you see i'm waiting well wait as long as you like said the monkey are you such a fool as to think that any creature keeps its heart in a tree your body is big but your wit is little no no here i am and here i mean to stay many thanks for bringing me over the crocodile snapped his jaws in disgust and went back to his wife feeling very foolish as he was and the monkey had such a feast in the fig tree as he never had in his life before the axe the drum the bowl and the diamond once upon a time there was a poor young man who went out into the world to seek his fortune he went aboard a ship sailing across the ocean and after they had sailed for a year and a day suddenly a great storm arose the rain descended and the wind blew and it blew so hard and so wild that the ship went miles out of her course and the skipper could not tell where they were and then in the middle of the night a great crash came and the ship was dashed upon a reef the waves beat and battered it and turned it topsy-turvy and the end of it was that every soul was drowned except the poor young man the waves washed him ashore more dead than alive and on the shore he lay till next morning when the sun warmed him and woke him up from his faint he got up and looked about him and wandered over the place which he found was an island it did not take him long to walk round it and then he saw that it was a small island and far as the eye could reach not another speck of land was to be seen there were plenty of trees growing in the island with fruit and flowers bananas and coconuts and springs of water but on the trees were no birds and no animals ran about on the ground so he lived on the fruits and roots and did the best he could one day to his great surprise he saw a black thing in the sky and still more surprising the black thing had no wings yet it was flying and flew nearer and nearer until he saw that it was a large wild pig how could a pig fly through the air he rubbed his eyes and looked again yes a pig it was beyond all doubt and it flew closer and closer until it came to the island he hid behind a bush and saw the pig sink slowly to the ground and lie down under a tree soon the pig was fast asleep and snoring he went up close and to his amazement by the pig's side was the most magnificent diamond he ever saw it blazed and sparkled in the sun and looked like a ball of fire he stepped gingerly up to the pig and took hold of the diamond the pig was very sleepy and snored away heartily as he turned the diamond about in his hand and saw it flash he suddenly thought to himself what if the pig should wake he looks fierce he has great sharp tusks and i have nothing to defend myself with if i were only up in that tree now but what on earth had happened as the thought came into his mind he found himself perched in the treetop for a little while he was quite dazed and dizzy then he began to wonder if it could be the diamond which had done this miracle so just to try he wished himself down again and there he was without knowing how 
he began to understand that this was a magic diamond and something which he must take great care of then he wished himself up in the tree again when he was in the tree once more he picked off a nut that was growing on the tree and dropped it upon the pig's nose the pig woke up raised his head and looked round for the diamond he was a very intelligent pig indeed he was really not a pig at all but a great magician who used to fly about in the shape of a pig because he was as wicked as could be and preferred being a pig rather than a man there are really a great many people like that only we see them in the shape of men and do not know the difference now when this pig saw that his diamond was gone he fell in a fury for all his power lay in the diamond and without it he was nothing more than any other pig so he glared and snorted and looked all around and down and up and then he saw the man who had dropped the nut upon his snout then his fury knew no bounds he foamed at the mouth and ran raging round and round the tree but the man only laughed and dropped more nuts on him this made him mad indeed for pigs cannot climb trees and he saw that his diamond was lost and with it all his magical power so in his madness he charged straight at the tree and ran his tusks right into the trunk there they stuck and tug as he would he could not get them out the man wished himself down from the tree and looked about for a large stone with which he battered the pig's skull till it was dead then he held the diamond over the pig so that the sun's rays shone down and were reflected through it and so fine and strong was the diamond that in a very short time a delicious smell of roast pork rose to his nostrils and the whole pig was done to a turn with rich crisp crackling then he took a sharp shell which he found lying on the beach and carved off slices of the pork which he ate it was very nice indeed and he had the best meal he had enjoyed since the ship had been wrecked on the reef and he had been cast ashore on that island by and by when he had finished his dinner it occurred to him that as the pig had flown there through the air so he might fly away so holding his diamond in his hand he wished to fly through the air to the nearest land then he felt himself rising and he was carried swiftly through the air and away away over the sea the island grew smaller it became a black patch it dwindled to a speck in the distance the sun shone warm upon him the waves sparkled underneath porpoises gambled about playing leapfrog in the sea flying fish came out of the water in a flash of light and dropped into the water again still he went on till as the sun was setting he came close to a sandy beach and there before long he stood wondering what he should do next he looked round and not far off behind a clump of bushes rose a thin column of smoke he put the diamond in his pocket and walked towards the smoke soon he saw a queer little hut and at the door upon the ground sat a man without any legs whether a shark had bitten off his legs or whether he never had any i cannot tell you for he never told me but there he sat like a chessman he had a fur cap and a fur coat he did not need any trousers for he had no legs to put them on as i have told you in front of him was a fire and over the fire was a spit and on the spit was a young kid roasting good evening sir said the young man good evening said the other can you give me a night shelter the young man asked whatever i have you may share said the old man with no legs so they sat down and ate a good meal but the young man was rather frightened to see that the other man ate skin and bones and everything and he did not like the way the old man eyed him in fact i must tell you that this old man was another magician and a friend of the magician who looked like a pig and when any travellers came that way he used to eat them he did not eat this traveller because the kid was already roasted but he meant to do it as soon as he should be hungry again how did you get here asked the old man i flew over the sea said the young man indeed said the old man 
and how did you manage that then the traveller showed his diamond and told the old man what a wonderful stone it was and how it gave any one power to fly through the air if you give me your diamond said the old man i will give you my axe you see i have no legs so you may wonder how i live this is the way i live if i slap this axe on the handle and say wood and fire away it flies and cuts wood and kindles a fire if i slap the steel and say heads away it flies and chops off the head of a goat or any animal i want and then it brings me meat for my dinner now i have lived here for a thousand years by the help of my axe and i am rather tired of being in one place i should like to see the world before i die and that is why i want your diamond all right said the young man it's a bargain they exchanged the axe and the diamond the old man turned it over in his hand chuckling greedily as soon as the young man got grip of the axe he smacked the steel and says he heads in a jiffy the axe sliced to the old man's neck like a turnip and he had no more head than legs then the traveller picked up the diamond and put it in his pocket so now he had two magic things instead of one he blessed his luck and fell asleep very happily inside the old magician's hut next morning with the diamond in his pocket and the axe on his shoulder the young man set out on his travels all day long he walked through the forest until at evening time he saw before him another hut like the first where lived the old man with no legs before this hut too there was a fire burning and beside the fire sat an old man without any arms whether a tiger had bitten off his arms or whether he never had any i cannot say because he never told me but there he sat like a pair of compasses he had the stump of a tree to sit on and before him was another stump and on this stump was a large bowl of milk out of which he was drinking when he saw our friend he tipped over this bowl with his chin instantly a deep roaring river surrounded him and his hut and he sat in the middle laughing at the young man's surprise but he did not laugh long for the young man instantly wished himself over the river and there he was now it was his turn to laugh how on earth did you do that asked the old man he was much too astonished to think of saying good day oh that's nothing said the young man and showed him his diamond the old man's eyes glistened he thought how nice it would be to have that diamond what do you say to selling me that diamond said he what will you give me for it asked the young man i will give you this bowl it is a wishing bowl whenever you are hungry all you have to do is to wish for something in it and there it is milk or soup or wine anything that can go in a bowl and if you turn it over as you saw me do just now a rushing roaring river pours out and surrounds you or if you like it will flood a whole country and drown every living thing dear me said the young man that is a wonderful bowl well i agree i'll give you my diamond for it so they exchanged the bowl and the diamond the old man took the diamond in his hand and watched it sparkle but he did not watch long for the young man slapped his hatchet and cried heads in a jiffy the steel sliced through the old man's neck like a cucumber and he had no more head than arms then the young man picked up his diamond and put it away in his pocket so now he had three wonderful things instead of two he blessed his good luck wished for some delicious wine in his bowl drank it and went to sleep happily in the old man's hut next morning the young man was up betimes and after taking a meal out of his wishing bowl he set out once more to walk through the forest after he had walked for some hours he heard far in the distance a loud rub-a-dub-dub rub-a-dub-dub boom-boom-boom he felt as if he could hardly help running away still with a great effort he began to walk towards the sound which got louder and louder every minute till at last it made a tremendous din 
then suddenly just as he came upon a little open glade in the forest he heard a rustle bustle jostle and out of the trees came a great herd of elephants lions tigers wolves and all sorts of wild animals their hair bristling with fright and every one of them tearing along at full speed they were far too much terrified to notice him and scurrying across the glade they vanished among the trees by this time the noise had ceased but it was not long before he came upon another little glade and at the end of the glade was a hut and in front of that hut sat a big black giant with a drum good day to you roared the giant in a great voice good day said the young man rather frightened come and have something to eat roared the giant oh thank you said the young man they sat down and the giant offered him some food but the young man thought it was safer not to take any of the giant's food so he pulled out his bowl and wished for some soup and sipped it what is that asked the giant the young man told him it was a wishing bowl that gave any food he wanted the giant was very much delighted with the wishing bowl and thought that if he could get that bowl he would be able to eat without the trouble of getting things i'll buy that bowl he roared what will you give me for it asked the young man i will give you this drum said the giant if you beat on one side everybody that hears it will run away ah that was why the lions and tigers were running away just now said the young man yes said the giant and if you beat on the other side a splendid army of soldiers and horses will spring up out of the ground and defend you all right here you are said the young man and gave him the bowl the giant took the bowl in great glee and horrid to tell wished out loud for a bowl full of blood he began to drink it but he did not finish for as he buried his nose in the bowl the young man slapped his axe and said heads down came the axe with a crash on the giant's head and cut it clean in two if the young man was glad when he saw the giant's head cleft in two he was gladder when he went inside the giant's hut for there all around the wall were the bodies of travellers who had passed that way and they were tied to the uprights of the wall and their bodies were dry as dust and shrivelled like a medlar for this giant used to catch all travellers and tie them up in his house and then he sucked their blood till they were dry so when our traveller saw what a narrow escape he had had he determined no longer to remain in that dreadful place picking up the bowl and the drum and feeling to see that his axe and the diamond were safe he wished himself at the gate of the nearest city now the king of this city was a very cruel king he used to rob and murder even his own subjects and as for strangers he had short shrift and no mercy for them so when the king heard that there was a stranger outside the gates he made up his mind to have some sport and sent out a company of soldiers to fetch him in the young man beat his drum and they all took to their heels you may imagine how angry the king was to hear this he had all their heads chopped off on the spot and sent a regiment the same thing happened to the regiment but this only made the king angrier than ever he ordered all his army to be marshalled before the gates and himself riding at their head led them forward to capture this audacious stranger then the young man tipped over his wishing bowl out poured a roaring torrent of water that flooded the plain and drowned every soldier in the army all except the king who had galloped back to the city and got up on the wall then the young man slapped his axe and cried heads i want the king's head off flew the axe through the air like a boomerang and sliced off the king's head and brought it back to its master the people inside the city began to cheer with joy when they saw the king with his head off and when the axe came back the young man beat upon the other side of his drum and lo and behold the earth began to tremble it seemed full of holes and from every hole sprouted a warrior fully armed surrounded by his army he marched into the city where he became king and lived happily ever after and i hope that we may be half as happy as he was end of part one
Part two of the Giant Crab and Other Tales from Old India retold by W. H. D. Rouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two The Wise Parrot and the Foolish Parrot, The Dishonest Friend, The Mouse and the Farmer, The Talkative Tortoise, The Monkey and the Gardener, The Goblin and the Sneeze, The Grateful Beasts and the Ungrateful Prince. THE WISE PARROT AND THE FOOLISH PARROT Once upon a time there was a man who had two pet parrots that could talk very nicely. Indeed, they had more sense than most people have, and when their master was alone he used to spend the evening chattering with them. They cracked jokes like any Christian and told the funniest tales but this man had a thievish maid-servant he had to lock everything up and even as it was never turned his back but she was filching and pilfering one day the man had to go away on a journey before he went he took out the two parrots and perched one on each fist and says he to them now beaky and tweaky i want you to watch the maid while i am gone and if she steals anything you are to tell me when i come home again they blinked at him, their eyelids coming up over their eyes from underneath, as you must have noticed in parrots, looking very solemn as they did so. Then Beaky said, If she do it, she shall rue it. But Tweaky said nothing at all, only winked again more solemnly than ever. Good, Beaky, said the man, naughty Tweaky. Then he went away. As soon as he was out of sight, the maid began her games. She picked the locks of his cupboards and ate the sugar, she ate the biscuits, she drank the wine. Beaky hopped into the room, stood on one leg, and shrieked, Naughty maid, aren't you afraid? Master will know, and you shall go. The maid jumped as if she had been shot and looked around. She thought somebody had caught her unawares, but when she saw it was Beaky, she put on a sweet smile and held out a lump of sugar saying in a coaxing voice pretty polly pretty beaky i won't do it again come then and have a nice lump of sugar this temptation was too strong for poor beaky he wanted very much to do his duty but he wanted the lump of sugar more so he put his head on one side and looking very wise sidled up to the maid this was the very wrong of beaky because he knew the sugar was stolen and in another minute he was sorry for as soon as he came within reach and pecked at the sugar, the maid caught him by the neck with the other hand. Then her smile changed, and she sneered. So Beaky is going to tell, is he? Tell, tell, tit. I'll teach Beaky to tell tales. As she said each word, she plucked out a feather from poor Beaky's head. Beaky shrieked, and Beaky struggled, but all in vain. She did not let him go till he was bald as a bullet. Tweaky saw all this, but said nothing, only winked and blinked and looked more solemn than ever. The maid looked at him, but thought she, that bird is too stupid to tell, and he isn't worth the trouble of plucking, so she left him alone. By and by the master came in. The maid went up to him in a great bustle, and said she had found Beaky stealing sugar, and she had plucked him as a punishment. When the evening came, the master sat in his room with Beaky and Tweaky. Poor Beaky felt ashamed of himself, and had nothing to say. He sat on his perch, the picture of misery, with his tail drooping and his ridiculous bald head. Tweaky said nothing at all. Now it happened that the master had a bald head too, and when he took off his skull-cap, which he generally wore to keep his head warm, Tweaky noticed it. He laughed loud and shrieked out, Oh, where's your feathers, tail tail tit Where's your feathers, tail tail tit Tweaky was only a parrot, you see, and was not always quite correct in his grammar, as you are. What do you mean? asked the master but for a long time Tweaky would say nothing but the same words over and over again. "'Where's your feathers, tail-tail tit?' However, by and by they heard the maid going to bed, tramp, tramp, tramp. Then Tweaky grew a little braver, and next time the master asked him what he meant, he replied, "'Every parrot has two eyes, both the foolish and the wise, but the wise can shut them tight when tis best to have no sight. 
wisdom has the best of it where's your feathers tail tail tit then the master understood what had happened for he was a very clever man and without any delay he ran upstairs two steps at a time and woke the maid and made her dress herself and turned her out of the house then and there i wonder why he did not do it before but that is no business of mine after that poor beaky never had the heart to talk again but tweaky whenever he saw a bald-headed man or a woman with a high forehead shrieked out at the top of his voice ha 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 where's your feathers tail tail tit the dishonest friend there was once a man who went on a journey and he asked a friend to take charge of his plough till he should return the friend promised to take great care of it but no sooner was the man gone than he sold the plough and put the price in his own pocket was not that a mean trick to serve a friend the man came back and asked his friend for the plough oh i am so sorry the friend replied my house is infested with rats and one night a very big rat came and ate it up ah well said the man what can't be cured must be endured it must have been a very big rat though it was said the other very big you must not suppose this man was quite such a fool as he seemed you will soon see why he did not make a fuss about his plough next day he took his friend's son out for a walk when they had gone some distance he took the boy to another friend's house and told this friend to keep the boy safe but not to let him go out of the house till he returned then he ran back to the boy's father where is my boy asked the father your boy oh i remember a hawk swooped down and carried him off oh you liar oh you murderer cried the friend come before the judge and then we shall see as you please said the man so they went to the court what is your complaint asked the judge my lord this man took my son out for a walk with him and came back alone and now he says a hawk carried him off he must have murdered the boy justice my lord justice what is this asked the judge sternly come my man tell the truth it is the truth my lord said the man he came with me for a walk and was carried away by a hawk nonsense said the judge who ever heard of a hawk carrying off a boy and who ever heard my lord of a rat eating a plough what do you mean asked the judge the man told his story then the judge saw that the man who complained had cheated his friend and understood what was the reason of this little trick so he said to the man whose son was lost if you find the plough that was entrusted to you perhaps your son may be found too the man was much annoyed at being found out but willy-nilly he had to give the plough back then his son was brought back safe to him again and he began to see that honesty is the best policy. THE MOUSE AND THE FARMER Once upon a time there was a mouse who made his hole in a place where there were thousands and thousands of golds and sovereigns buried in the ground. Now there was a farmer who owned the land where this treasure was buried, but he did not know about it, or else of course he would have dug it up. He often noticed the little mouse sitting with his head peeping out of the hole but as he was a very kind farmer he never hurt the mouse and now and then when he was having his own dinner he would throw the mouse a bit of cheese the mouse was very grateful to the farmer and wondered what he could do to show it at last he thought of the treasure for this mouse was sensible enough to know that farmers are very pleased to get a golden sovereign now and again so one day as the farmer went by the hole mousie ran out with a golden sovereign in his mouth and dropped it at the farmer's feet you can imagine how glad the farmer was to see a golden sovereign indeed it was the first one he had seen since the corn laws were abolished so he thanked the mouse and went down to the village and bought him a beautiful piece of meat after this the mouse every day brought the farmer a golden sovereign and every day the farmer gave him a big chunk of meat thus in a few weeks mousie grew quite fat but the farmer had a big black cat that used to prowl about watching for mice it used never to notice the farmer's own favorite mouse while the mouse was thin but when he grew sleek and fat and shiny grimalkin which was the cat's name lay in wait for him one day and pounced upon him 
Poor little Mousie was terrified. "'Please don't kill me, Mr. Grimalkin,' said Mousie. "'Why not? I'm hungry and you are fat.' "'But, sir, if you eat me now, you'll be hungry tomorrow, won't you?' "'Of course I shall,' said Grimalkin. "'Well,' said Mousie, who had suddenly thought of a plan, "'if you will only let me go, I'll bring you a beautiful juicy piece of meat every day.' This was a tempting offer for Grimalkin, who was a lazy cat, and liked sitting by the fire and licking himself all over, better than hunting for mice. "'All right,' said he. "'Only if you leave out one day, you're a dead mouse.' Then, with a frightful spit, bristling up all his whiskers and eyebrows, Grimalkin ran away. So next day, when the farmer gave Mousie his dinner, Mousie carried it off to the black cat, and the black cat spat and swore and ate it up, and away ran Mousie trembling. But by degrees Mousie grew thinner and thinner, because Grimalkin always had his dinner, and soon he was nothing but skin and bone. Then the farmer noticed how thin his mouse had become, so one day he asked the mouse whether he was ill. No, said Mousie, I'm not ill. What is the matter then? asked the farmer. I never get any dinner now, said Mousie, with tears running down over his nose, because Grimalkin eats it all. Then he told the farmer about the bargain he had made with Grimalkin. Now the farmer had a beautiful piece of glass with a hole in the middle. I think it was an inkstand, but I am not sure. So he took this piece of glass and put Mousie inside it, and turned it upside down upon the ground in front of Mousie's hole. Now, said he, next time Grimalkin comes for your dinner, tell him you have none for him, and see what will happen. So next day up comes Grimalkin for his dinner, spitting and looking very fierce. Meat, meat, says he to the mouse. Get off, vile thief, said Mousie. I've no meat for the likes of you. At this Grimalkin could hardly believe his ears. He was in a rage, I can tell you, and without stopping to think, pounced upon Mousie, and swallowed him, ink stand and all. You see, as it was all glass, Grimalkin did not know that there was any ink stand there, because he saw the mouse through it. Now cats can digest a good deal, but they cannot digest a glass ink stand. So Grimalkin, when he had swallowed the mouse and the ink stand, felt a pain inside, and this got worse and worse, until at last he died and then Mousie crept out of the inkstand and crawled up through Grimalkin's throat and went back to his hole again, and there he lived all his life in happiness, every day bringing a golden sovereign to the farmer, who gave him, every day, a beautiful dinner of meat. THE TALKATIVE TORTOISE Once upon a time there was a tortoise that lived in a pond. He was a most worthy tortoise, but he had one fault he would talk in season and out of season. All day long it was chatter, chatter, chatter in that pond, until the fish said that they would rather live on dry land than put up with it any longer. But the tortoise had two friends, a pair of young geese, who used to fly about near the pond in search of food, and when they heard that things were getting hot for the tortoise in that pond, because he talked so much, they flew up to him and cried eagerly, oh tortoise do come along with us we have such a beautiful home away in the mountains where you may talk all day long and nobody shall worry you there all oh, very well grumbled the tortoise but how am i to get there i can't fly oh we'll carry you if you can only keep your mouth shut for a little while yes i can do that says he when i like let us be off so the geese picked up a stout stick, and one goose took one end in her bill, and the other goose took the other end, and then they told the tortoise to get hold in the middle. Only be careful, said they, not to talk. The tortoise set his teeth fast on the stick, and held on like grim death, while the geese, flapping their strong wings, rose in the air and flew towards their home. All went well for a time, but it so happened that some boys were looking up in the air and were highly amused by what they saw. "'Look there!' cried one to the rest. Two geese carrying a tortoise on a stick!' The tortoise, on hearing this, was so angry that he forgot all about his danger, and opened his mouth to cry out, "'What's that to you? Mind your own business!' 
but he got no farther than the first word for when his mouth opened he loosed the stick down he dropped and fell with a crash on the stones the talkative tortoise lay dead with his shell cracked in two the monkey and the gardener once upon a time there was a beautiful park full of all manner of trees and shrubs with beds of flowers set here and there and no end of fruit trees a gardener used to take care of this park pruning the trees when they made too much wood and digging the ground and watering the flowers in dry weather it happened that there was a fair to be held away in the city and the gardener very much wanted to go but who would take care of the park and garden if his master came in and found all the flowers drooping or dead what would he say then it would never do meditating thus and in doubt he looked up into the branches of the trees and a bright thought struck him i must tell you that in this park there were not only herds of deer and plenty of rabbits and other creatures that usually live in parks but there were troops of monkeys in the trees who climbed and chattered and cracked nuts all day long with no lessons to do and when the gardener cast up his eyes to the trees he saw some monkeys that he knew very well indeed many a time he had been kind to them and now he thought they should do the like by him as one good turn deserves another so the gardener called out monkeys i want you down they all clambered and in a very short time they were sitting beside him on the grass monkeys said he i have been a good friend to you letting you eat my nuts and apples and now i want to take a holiday will you water my garden while i am away oh yes 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 cried the monkeys they thought it a great joke and leaped for joy so the gardener handed over his watering pots to the monkeys and put on his sunday clothes and went away to the fair meanwhile the monkeys held a solemn council sitting in a ring round the monkey chief brothers said the monkey chief our good friend the gardener has given us charge of this garden and all there is in it we must take care not to hurt anything and above all not to waste the water there is very little water and i really don't think it will go round it was in fact a well very small at the top but very deep and at the bottom the water was always running you might have watered till doomsday out of that well but monkeys though they are cunning are not wise and these monkeys thought that a little round hole could not hold very much water so you see the monkey chief went on you must give each plant just enough water and no more and i think the best way will be to see how long the roots are so each monkey took a watering pot and they scattered all over the garden every bush and every plant they carefully pulled up and measured its root and then they gave a great deal of water to plants with long roots and only a little when the roots were short after that they put the plants and bushes back in the holes they came from after a day or two back came the gardener from his fair but what was his horror to see that nearly all the plants in the garden were drooping some of them dead and many dying while the monkeys were busy in every direction pulling up the rest oh dear oh dear what in the world are you doing my garden is ruined my garden is ruined the poor gardener wept for sorrow the chief monkey was very much surprised he thought he had been very clever to put water according to the size of the roots and he said so clever said the gardener clever indeed fools you are there is no mistake about that fools they may be said his master who had come up behind him without being seen but after all that is their nature you ought to have known better than to put monkeys in charge of a garden and you are a greater fool than they then he sent that gardener away and got another the goblin and the sneeze once upon a time there was a very powerful goblin who haunted a little house just outside the gates of a city nobody else lived in this house there was a big black beam that ran across from one side to the other up in the roof and there this goblin perched for twelve years he had served the king of the goblins faithfully and as a reward he was now permitted to gobble up any man who sneezed inside that house and indeed that is why these creatures are called goblins but if when a man sneezed someone said god bless you as people do say or may you live a hundred years 
then the man who said it was free and if the other answered the same to you he was free too everybody but these the goblin might gobble up for a single sneeze now it fell out that one day a father and son were travelling along the road and they came to the city gates just as the sun went down i must tell you that in those days the people used to shut the city gates fast at sunset and nothing would make them open again till the morning they were horribly afraid of robbers or wild soldiers who might come and damage them in the night so when these two wayfarers came to the gates and wanted to go in the porter said no now do we look like robbers asked the father certainly they did not dusty and grimy with their trudge and a bag of tools over the shoulder robbers or no robbers orders are orders said the porter and this gate doesn't open for the king himself well what are we to do the poor fellow was in despair oh there's an empty house outside there it is amongst the trees it is haunted they say but i dare say the goblin won't hurt you goblin well we must take our chance i suppose indeed there was nothing for it so to the house they went they rested and cooked a meal for themselves on a fire of sticks and then prepared to go to sleep the goblin however was not going to let them off so easily he wanted his dinner too after waiting a long time with never a sneeze from one or the other he raised a cloud of fine dust that was rather mean of him but still he was very hungry and did not stick at trifles sure enough the father nearly sneezed his head off the goblin chuckled and made ready to pounce from his perch and devour the pair of them but the son happened to see him and being a sharp lad he guessed the truth god bless you father says he may you live a hundred years now the goblin gnashed his teeth however if his pudding was lost his meat was left so he stretched out a great claw to clutch the father and tear him to pieces just then the father cried thank you my son and the same to you he was only just in time the claw was within an inch of his throat but the goblin baffled flew up to his perch again and sat mouthing and mumbling there then the son began to talk to this goblin and showed him the error of his ways and how cruel he was to eat men and the end of it was he persuaded the goblin to become a vegetarian and to follow him about and be his errand boy you will think this was a very soft-hearted goblin perhaps no one had ever spoken kindly to him before anyhow whatever the reason was he went out with the two travellers as tame as a tabby cat and for all i know they may be travelling together to this very day the grateful beasts and the ungrateful prince once upon a time there was a king and he had a son and this son was so cruel and disagreeable that he took delight in hurting people and never spoke to anybody without an oath or a blow he was a thorn in the flesh to everybody he came across he was like grit in the porridge like a fly in the eye like a stone in the shoon and they called him the wicked prince one day the wicked prince went down to the river to bathe along with a number of servants by and by a great storm came on and the clouds were so thick that it became pitch dark however this prince was obstinate and would not give up his bathe and as he was too lazy even to bathe himself he swore at his servants and said you lazy beast bathe me and look sharp about it or i'll tickle you with a cat o nine tails now the servants had had enough of this young bully and thought they what if we pitch him into the river where the current is strong and just leave him there we can easily pretend he was carried away where we could not reach him and if the king finds us out and puts us to death anyhow death is better than his eternal bullying so they pitched him head over heels into the water though he screamed and struggled and then they went home and told the king that he had gone in to bathe and a flood carried him away i dare say it was wicked of them to tell such a lie but it was more the prince's fault than theirs meanwhile the prince had got hold of a tree that had been torn up by the roots and climbing upon it went floating down the river now on the banks of this river lived a snake 
The snake had once been a very rich man, and he had buried a vast treasure on the river bank, and he loved his riches more than he loved his own soul, so when he died he was born again as a snake and had to live forever close to his buried hoard. And a rat that lived close by had also been a man once and buried his money as the snake had done, instead of using it in doing good. So he was born as a rat and made a hole where his money lay. These two creatures were caught by the flood, and it so happened that they saw the tree where the wicked prince was, and swimming to it, each got on one end, while the prince was in the middle, and a young parrot flying through the air was beaten down by the rain, for in that country the drops of rain were as big as pigeons' eggs, and no birds can fly through it. Then it so happened that this parrot dropped down upon the same tree where the snake was, and the rat, and the wicked prince, and so there were four of them on the tree, floating down the river. As the tree came near to a bend in the river, it was washed close to the bank, and on the bank a man was sitting. He did not mind the rain a bit, because he was a hermit, who thought the world so wicked that he left it and went to live in the jungle all by himself. He built himself a little hut by the riverside, and, wet or fine, he cared not a jot. This man saw the tree and managed to catch hold of it and pull it ashore. Then he got the four creatures off it and took them into his hut and dried them and warmed them by the fire. But he began with the parrot because she looked the most miserable of them all. And then he dried the rat, and next the snake, and only attended to the man when he had comforted the other three. This made the wicked prince very angry. If he abused even those who made much of him, you may imagine how he cursed and swore in his heart at this man who left him to the last. But he said nothing, because he was afraid that if he did the man might turn him out in the storm again. In a day or two the rain stopped and the flood went down, and the creatures were all right again as they took their leave of the hermit. The snake thanked him for his kindness and said, you have saved my life, good hermit. What can I do for you? You seem to be a poor man. I am rich, and if you ever want money, just come to my hole and call Snake, and you can have all my treasure. Goodbye. The rat said the same. The parrot was very sorry to think that she had no money, so she said, Silver and gold have I none, but if you ever are hungry and you want some rice, come to my tree and call Parrot, and I'll get you as much rice as ever you like. But the wicked prince hated this kind hermit, because he had been left to the last. However, he pretended to be grateful, and said to the hermit, I hope you will pay me a visit soon. I am a prince, and I shall be glad of a chance to repay you for all you have done for me. Then he went away, chuckling to think how he would torment the poor hermit, if ever he got him into his power. This hermit had all his wits about him, and he knew that people often promise what they never mean to do, so after a while he thought he would put them all to the test. So first he took his stick and journeyed to the city where the wicked prince lived. The prince, who was king himself now, saw him coming, and thought to himself, "'Aha! Here's that rascal that left me to the last. Wants me to pay him for it, I suppose. Well, I'll pay him. I'll pay him out.' So he called to his men, "'Hi there, brutes! Do you see that fellow? He tried to rob me the other day. Just catch him and give him a flogging, and then stick a stake through his body and leave him to die.' Then the servants caught the hermit and flogged him well, but the hermit did not cry out or grumble, only kept on saying to himself quietly, "'The proverb's true, the proverb's true.' "'What proverb do you mean?' they asked him. It's unlucky to save a drowning man, said the hermit. Then he told them the whole story, and very angry they were when they heard it. They stopped beating the hermit at once, and seizing the wicked king, they beat him instead, and stuck a stake through his body, and left him to die. Then they made the hermit king instead of the wicked prince, and the hermit took them a walk into the country, and when they came to the snake's hole he called out, Snake! Out came the snake, and curled up against his feet, and showed him the hole where his treasure was, and the hermit gave it all to his servants. And then they went to the rat's hole, and he called out, Rat, 
and the rat ran out and rubbed his nose against the king's hand and gave him all his treasure which the king gave to his servants as well as the other and last of all they went to the parrot's tree and called parrot and the parrot flew up and gave a call and instantly all the air was black with parrots and all the parrots carried a grain of rice in their beaks and dropped it on the ground and there was such a heap of rice that it was enough to feed all the people for the rest of their lives so the grateful beasts kept their promise and the ungrateful prince was killed and the hermit ruled over his people kindly and they all lived happily until they died and when they died they all went to heaven and the snake and the rat and the parrot went there too because they had at last overcome their love of money and given it away to show how grateful they were to the hermit for being kind to them end of part two part three of the giant crab and other tales from old india retold by w h d rouse this librivox recording is in the public domain part three the goblin in the pool the foolish farmer and the king the pious wolf birds of a feather spend a pound to win a penny the cunning crane and the crab union is strength silence is golden the great yellow king and his porter the goblin in the pool animals in the forest have no bottles and glasses to drink out of so if they are thirsty they have to go down to a pool now in a certain great forest there was a pool in which lived a horrible goblin he was big and black like an immense monkey with an immense mouth and four rows of sharp teeth but he could not come out of the water because he had no nose but only gills like a fish so if any animal came down into the water to get a drink he pounced upon him at once and gobbled him up but he could not touch the animals while they remained on the bank one year there was a great drought and the sun was so hot that it dried up all the water in that forest for many miles around except the pool where this goblin was but this pool was very deep and cool under the trees and therefore it was not dried up there was a herd of monkeys who had been wandering about for a long time in search of water but found none until they came to this pool but the king of the monkeys was very clever and he noticed that there were a great many footprints going down to the water and none coming away so he warned his monkeys not to go near that pool however one of them was very thirsty and ran down into the water but as soon as he got into the water and was having a delicious drink suddenly he disappeared there were some bubbles and no more was seen of the monkey the other monkeys watched for a long time wondering what had become of their friend and then another who was so thirsty that he could not help it stepped quietly into the water and began to drink in an instant he gave a shriek and threw up his hands and the others saw him dragged down below the water a few bubbles came up to the top and burst but the poor monkey was gone what were they to do they were dying of thirst and yet they were afraid to drink the banks were high and they could not reach the water from the top so they all sat round the banks looking at the water very unhappy by and by a man came down to the side of the pool he wanted a drink of water but he had no glass so he looked round and then he saw the monkeys sitting on the bank very unhappy what's the matter said he don't go into that pool said the king of the monkeys if you do you will be drowned like our two poor friends then they told him how their friends had gone into the water to drink and how they had both been pulled underneath and drowned none of them could tell how the man understood at once that it was a goblin so he pulled up a long reed that was growing on the bank of the pool and cut off the ends and then he put down one end of it into the water and sucked at the other end and the water came up from the pool into his mouth at this the monkeys were delighted and they all pulled up reeds from the bank for you know how a monkey always imitates what he sees men do and sucked up the water through them 
and so quench their thirst without going into the pool and the goblin finding that no more food was to be got died of starvation and a good thing too the foolish farmer and the king once there was a foolish farmer who had a son at court serving the king this farmer was a very poor man and all he had to plough his fields with was one pair of oxen two oxen was all he had and one of them died the poor farmer was in despair one ox was not enough to draw the plough over the heavy land and he had no money to buy another so he sent a message to his son that he was wanted at home when the son came his father told him that one of his oxen was dead and he had no money to buy another so he begged his son to ask the king to give him an ox oh no no said his son i am always asking the king for something if you want an ox you must ask him yourself i can't do it said the poor farmer you know what a muddlehead i am if i go to ask the king for another ox i shall end by giving him this one well what must be must be said his son anyhow i cannot ask the king but i'll train you to do it so he led his father to a place which was dotted all over with clumps of grass the young courtier tied up a number of bundles of this grass and arranged them in rows now look here father said he this is the king that is the prime minister that is the general here are the other grandees pointing to each bundle as he said the name when you come into the king's presence you must begin by saying long live the king and then ask your boon to help him to remember the son made up a little verse for his father to say and this is the verse i had two oxen to my plough with which my work was done now one is dead o mighty king please give me another one well said the farmer i think i can say that and he repeated it over and over bowing and scraping to the bunch of grass that he called the king every day for a whole year the farmer practised and how the ploughing got on meanwhile i do not know perhaps he lived on the seed corn and did not plough at all at the end of the year he said to his son now i know that little verse of yours now i can say it before any man take me to the king so together father and son trudged away to the king's palace there on a throne he sat in gorgeous robes with his courtiers all around him the prime minister the general and all just as the young man had told his father but the poor farmer his head was beginning to swim already who is this said the king to the farmer's son who as you know was a courtier so the king knew him it is my father sire he answered what does he want the king asked all eyes were turned on the farmer who by this time was as red as a turkey cock and hardly knew whether he stood on head or heels however he plucked up courage and out came the verse as pat as a pancake i had two oxen to my plough with which my work was done now one is dead o mighty king please take the other one the king couldn't help laughing and he saw there must be a mistake somewhere plenty of oxen at home eh said he keeping up the joke if so sire said the farmer's son with a bow you must have given them the king thought that rather neat if i have not given you any so far said he smiling i will do it now and when the pair got home the farmer in despair at his blunder lo and behold in his cow-house were half a dozen of the finest oxen he had ever seen so the poor old farmer got his oxen though he did make a muddle of the verse the pious wolf once there was a flood and there was a large rock with a wolf sleeping on the top the water came pouring round the rock and when the wolf awoke he found himself imprisoned with no way of getting off and nothing to eat Hmm, said he to himself here i am caught fast sure enough and here i shall have to stay yet a while nothing to eat either well he thought after a pause it is friday to-day when people say you ought to fast suppose i keep a holy fast to-day a capital idea so he crossed his paws and pretended to pray and thought himself very good and pious to be fasting 
a fairy saw this and heard what he said and she thought she would just see how much was real and how much was sham so she changed herself into the shape of a pretty little kid and jumped down out of the air onto the rock the wolf opened an eye to see what the noise could be and there was a tender little kid standing on the rock he forgot his prayers in a minute aha said he a kid i can keep my friday fast to-morrow now for the kid he smacked his lips and jumped at the kid but the kid jumped away and try as he would he could not come near it you know it was the fairy and the fairy did not let herself be caught after trying to catch the kid for some time the wolf lay down again after all said he it is friday and perhaps i can best keep my fast to-day you humbug said the fairy who had gone back to her proper shape you are a nice creature to pretend that you are keeping fast you fast because you can't help it not because you are really good as a punishment you shall stay on this rock till next friday and fast for a week so saying she opened her wings and flew far away birds of a feather once upon a time there was a big horse called chestnut he was as fierce as a fury and bit everybody who came near him his groom always had a broken bone or a bruise at the least and as for the other horses let chestnut loose in the herd and there was a fine to do a kick for one a bite for another it was hurry scurry worry till they took themselves off and left him alone in the clover now the king wanted to buy some horses and a dealer had driven down a couple of hundred of them for the king to buy but the king was a skinflint and wanted to get them cheap so he dropped a hint to his groom that it would not be a bad thing if chestnut made acquaintance with these horses at the same time he dropped a gold piece in the groom's hand so the groom led chestnut by this new herd and all of a sudden he quietly flicked chestnut with his whip chestnut reared and plunged the groom shouted and pretending to find the horse too strong for him let go the halter off galloped chestnut kicking up his heels in the air roaring and whinnying and fine fun he had among the new horses by the time he had done with them hardly one had a whole skin the poor dealer was in despair he would be ruined and next day when the king came to see the horses he turned up his nose pooh do you suppose i want bruised old hacks like that look at that sore and here is a broken jaw why half of them limp in vain the dealer protested that it was chestnut's fault the king only laughed and asked if he expected him to believe that one horse could do all that mischief and yet as you know it was one horse and at the king's own bidding too however it was a pity that he should have to take them back again the king said so if he liked as a favor he would buy the horses at half price the dealer was not taken in by this but he pretended to be very grateful and went home again wondering what he could do he was afraid to offend the king and indeed very few people were rich enough to buy his splendid horses so he knew that he would be obliged to take some more down to the king another time then he suddenly remembered he had just such another vicious brute at home named strong jaw that nobody could do anything with aha said he i have it i'll take strong jaw down with me next time and if he does not prove a match for chestnut i am very much mistaken he chuckled with glee as he thought what a fine fight there would be between the two next time as he had resolved he brought strong jaw with the drove and as soon as the king's groom came by with chestnut and let him go as he did before the dealer's eyes twinkled and he let out strong jaw chestnut pricked up his ears and strong jaw pricked up his then without taking any notice of the rest they trotted up to each other and rubbed noses and began to lick each other over all they did not fight at all but in a moment they became bosom friends the dealer could not understand this neither could the king however this time the king had to pay a good price for the horses and as he saw his little trick was found out he felt rather ashamed of himself 
and so he paid the man for the other horses as well still uh, they kept wondering and wondering what the reason could be that these two horses each so fierce and wild were quiet as a pair of kittens together the king asked the wisest man in all his kingdom to explain it the man who was a minstrel that is he used to sing songs to the king about all that had happened or would happen in the world took up his harp and sang if the reason you would know like to like will always go here's a pair of vicious horses just the same in all their courses both are wild and bite their tether birds of a feather flock together spend a pound to win a penny some people were steaming peas under a tree in order to make a meal for their horses up in the branches sat a monkey who watched with his restless eyes what they were doing aha thought the monkey i spy my dinner so when they had finished steaming the peas and turned away for a moment to look after the horses gently gently the monkey let himself down from the tree he grabbed at the peas and stuffed his mouth with them and both hands as full as he could hold then he clambered up to his perch as best he could there he sat his wizened old face happy and cunning eating the peas suddenly one pea fell oh dear oh dear oh my pea my pea cried the monkey gibbering in distress the other peas began to fall out of his mouth but he did not notice them he wrung his hands in despair and the peas began to fall out of his hands too but he took no notice all he thought of was this that one pea was gone so he shinnied down the trunk and scrambled about on the ground hunting for his lost pea but he could not find it anywhere by this time the men had come back after seeing to their horses when they saw a monkey meddling with their cooking pots they all waved their arms and called out shoo shoo then they picked up stones and began to pelt the monkey with them this terrified the monkey so much that he gave one jump to the nearest branch and swung himself up to the top of the tree after all said he to himself it was only one pea but he ought to have thought of that before for now like a thunderclap it came home to him that somehow or other all the other peas had gone too that day the monkey had to content himself with the smell of boiled peas for dinner and i hope the loss taught him not to be so greedy in future the cunning crane and the crab once upon a time a number of fish lived in a little pool it was all very well while there was rain but when summer came and it began to be very hot the water dried up and got lower and lower until there was hardly enough to hide the fish now not far away there was a beautiful lake always fresh and cool for it lay under the shadow of great trees and it was covered all over with water lilies and a crane lived on the banks of this lake the crane used to eat fish when he could catch any and one day coming to the little pool he saw all the fish gasping in it and thought of a neat trick to get hold of them without trouble dear fish said the crane i am so sorry to see you cooped up in this hole i know a beautiful lake close by deep and fresh and cool and if you like i will carry you there the fish did not know what to make of this because never since the world began had a crane done a good turn to a fish you see it is just as absurd to suppose that a crane would help fish as to think that a cat would be kind to a mouse so they said to the crane we don't believe you what you want is to eat us this was just what the crane did want but he did not say so oh no no said he i'm not so cruel as all that i have eaten a fish now and then he saw it was of no use denying that because they knew he had but i have plenty of other food and it goes to my heart to see you here in this hot water you will all be boiled fish before long well, that's true enough said the fish the water is hot well the end of it was they persuaded an old fish with one eye to go and see the crane took the one-eyed fish in his beak and put him in the lake and when he had seen that what the crane said was true so far he carried the fish back again to tell the others the old fish could not say enough to praise the lake 
it's ever so big he said and deep and cool just as the crane said and there are trees overshadowing it and water lilies are growing in the mud and the whole of it is covered with fine fat flies ah what a feast i have had and he rolled up his one eye at the thought of it then all the fish were eager to go and now it was who should be first every fish was anxious to remain no longer in the pool they came to the top of the water all begging the crane to take them to this beautiful lake one at a time said the crane i have only one beak you know and he smiled to himself for that beak was made to eat fish not to carry them however it was decided that as the one-eyed fish had been so brave as to trust himself in the crane's beak before he knew what the truth was he certainly deserved to go first so the crane took the one-eyed fish in his beak and carried him over to the lake but this time he did not drop the fish in he laid him in the cleft of a tree and pecked his one eye out with his beak then he killed him and ate him up and dropped his bones at the foot of the tree by and by the crane came back for another now then who's next asked the crane old one eye is swimming about as happy as a king he picked up another fish and served him like the first dropping his bones at the foot of the tree and so it went on until in a few days the pool was empty the cunning crane had eaten every single one of the fish he stood on the bank peering into every hole to see whether there might not be a little one left somewhere there was one surely no it was a crab never mind he thought all's fish that comes to my net so he invited the crab to come with him to the lake why how are you going to carry me asked the crab in my beak to be sure replied the crane oh you might drop me said the crab and then i should split oh no i promise i won't drop you said the crane but the crab had more sense than all the fish put together and he did not believe in the crane's friendship at all so he still pretended to hesitate and at last he said well i'll tell you what i can hold on tighter with my claws than you can with your beak i'll come but you must let me hold on to your neck with my claws then i shall feel safe the crane was so hungry that without stopping to think he agreed and then the crab got tight hold of his neck with his claws and the crane carried him towards the lake but after a while the crab saw that he was being carried somewhere else indeed to that tree where the crane used to sit and eat the fish crane dear said he aren't you going to put me in the lake crane dear indeed said the crane do you suppose i was born to carry crabs about not i just look at that heap of bones under yon tree those are the bones of the fish that used to live in your pool i ate them and i'm going to eat you are you though said the crab and gave the crane's neck a little nip then the crane saw what a fool he had been to let a crab put a claw round his neck he knew that the crab could kill him if he liked and he was frightened to death at the thought people who try to deceive others often pay for it themselves and that is what happened to the crane dear crab said he with tears streaming from his eyes forgive me i won't kill you only let me go just put me in the lake then said the crab the crane stepped down to the lakeside and laid the crab upon the mud and the crab as soon as he felt himself safe nipped off the crane's head as clean as if it had been cut with a knife so perished the treacherous crane caught by his own trick and the crab lived happily in the beautiful lake for the rest of his life union is strength there once was a clever fowler who used to hunt quails he could imitate the quail's note exactly and when he had found a hiding place he used to sit hidden in it and call out the quail's note until a number of quails had come together then he threw a net over them and bagged them all but amongst the quails was one very clever bird and he hit on the following device he told the quails when they felt the net drop over them that each one should pop his head through one of the meshes of the net and then at the word away they would fly together 
all fell out as he arranged next day the fowler sounded his imitation of the quail's note and the birds flocked from far and near then when a good many had gathered in a clump within his reach he cast the net which fell over them and made them all prisoners they all did what the wise quail had told them each quail put his head through one of the meshes then at a word they were all away together bearing the net with them after some little time they saw a large bush and dropped upon this bush and then the net was held up by the bush while all the birds got away underneath again and again this happened until the fowler began to despair he came home every night empty-handed and besides that he had lost ever so many nets why did he keep on trying to catch them then because he thought that sooner or later they would begin to quarrel and then the game would be his and quarrel they soon did one quail happened to tread on another's toe what are you doing clumsy said the second quail angrily oh i'm very sorry said the first i really did not mean to tread on your toe you did i tell you i didn't what a lie a lie is it hoity-toity how high and mighty we are to be sure i suppose it is you lift up the net all by yourself when the man throws it over us and so they went on getting angrier and angrier and the result was that next day when the fowler made his cast said the first quail to the second now then samson lift away they say that last time your feathers all fell off your head oh indeed they say that when you tried to lift both your wings molted lift away and let us see if it is true but while they were quarrelling and each telling the other to lift the net the fowler lifted it for them crammed them all together into his basket and took them home for dinner silence is golden once upon a time a lion had a she-jackal for his mate and they had a young one this cub was just like his sire to look at in shape and color mane and claws but in voice he took after his dam so you would fancy he was a lion so long as he held his tongue this cub used to play about with the young lions and merry times they had to be sure tumbling head over heels and trying to knock each other down one day in the midst of their game the mongrel cub thought he would frighten them so he opened his mouth wide intending to roar and all that came out was a yelp like the yelp of a jackal the other young lions were quite shocked they could not imagine what strange creature this was one of them went up to the old lion who was watching them and said lion's claws and lion's paws lion's feet to stand upon but the bellow of this fellow sounds not like a lion's son you are right said the old lion his dam was a jackal and then turning to the poor cub who was looking very crestfallen he said all will see what kind you be if you yelp as once before so don't try it but keep quiet yours is not a lion's roar the poor little cub slunk away with his tail between his legs while the other lions sniffed and turned up their noses at him ever after that he took good care to hold his tongue when he was in the company of his betters the great yellow king and his porter once upon a time in a great and rich city reigned a mighty king who was called by the title of the great yellow king this king was very cruel to his people and ground them like grist in the mill he robbed them of their goods many he cast into prison others he ill-treated cutting off an arm or a leg or blinding them and some he put to death without cause he was just as bad at home when he was a boy he did nothing but tease his sisters pulling their hair and putting spiders down their necks and now that he was grown up he made life a misery to wife and child he was like a speck of dust that gets into your eye or a thorn in the heel or grit between your teeth but it is a long lane that has no turning and at last the great yellow king died when a king or queen dies people are generally very sorry and wear mourning for them 
but when the great yellow king died there was such rejoicing and merriment as had not been known for many a long day all the shops were shut and all the schools had a whole holiday there were rarey shows and merry-go-rounds and everybody high and low was half daft with joy but one man was not joyful on the steps of the palace sat the yellow king's porter sighing and sobbing weeping and wailing no one could understand it everybody in the whole town was glad and here was this porter crying at last some one asked him why he cried what is the matter said he was the great yellow king so kind to you as all that i never heard of his being kind to anybody no it isn't that sobbed the man well what is it then the man looked up and rubbed his eyes well he said i'll tell you when his majesty used to come out of his palace down the steps he always gave me a cuff on the head and another when he came back what a fist his majesty had to be sure now if he tries that game on with the porter who sits by the gates of death i am very much afraid they won't have him there at any price and then he will come back to us but the other man laughed and said <laughs> don't be afraid of that porter he's dead and done for and however much they wish it they can never send him back to us again so the porter was comforted and wiped his eyes and went to get a glass of beer end of part three Part four of The Giant Crab and Other Tales from Old India, retold by W. H. D. Rouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part four. The Quail and the Falcon, Pride Must Have a Fall, The Bold Beggar, The Jackal Would a Wooing Go, The Lion and the Boar, The Goblin City, Black Nose, The King's Lesson. The Quail and the Falcon there once was a young quail that lived on a farm when the farmer ploughed up the land quailie used to hop about over the clods and pick up seeds or weeds or worms or anything that the plough turned up and he ate these and lived on them you might think this was very nice for him he had no trouble to find food because the ploughman turned it up he had only to hop along after the plough and peck not a bit of it he must needs better himself as he said so one fine day he flew away over the farm, away to the forest which fringed it, and, alighting on the ground just where the forest began, he looked about to see if there was anything good to eat. Up in the air, just above the treetops, a falcon was sailing, poised on outstretched wings. As Quayley searched for worms, so the falcon was searching for quails, and lo and behold he spied one down he came with a swoop and a whirr and in an instant the quail was in his crooked claws what could poor quaily do now he twittered and fluttered and at last began to cry oh dear oh dear whimpered quaily the tears running down his beak what a fool i was to poach on other people's preserves if i had only stayed at home this falcon could never have caught me not even if he had come and tried what's that quaily asked the falcon do you think i can't catch you anywhere not on my own ground cried the quail what do you mean by that a ploughed field full of clods oh nonsense quaily clods won't help you just try off you go i'll follow the quail flew off feeling as happy now as he was miserable a moment gone and when he got back to his farm he picked out a big clod and perched on the top come on falcon cried he come on down came the falcon with a swoop like a flash of lightning but just as he came close the quail dodged him nimbly and tumbled over the clod to the other side leaving the falcon to come full tilt against the clod of earth and so swift was he that the shock killed him so the quail found out how much better it is for most people to stick to what they are used to and as for the falcon he might have thought if he had been able to think at all that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush pride must have a fall 
once upon a time there was a beautiful wild goose that lived in the mountains he was king of the geese and he had a mate and two or three fine young ones but it had happened once that this goose in his travels about the world fell in with a young lady crow who was very pretty as black as jet with two eyes like black beads and she flirted and flouted so enchantingly that he had married her like the goose he was so he had two wives the little black crow and the goose in course of time this crow laid a beautiful egg all white with blue spots and twice as big as an ordinary crow's egg she was very proud of her egg and sat on it for a long time until one day pop went the egg and out came a funny little chick the crow did not know what to make of this chick he was not black as she was and he was not white like his father but something betwixt and between a dingy gray with brown streaks so she named him streaky be sure that streaky fancied himself mightily being so very different from all the crows he lived with he was larger to begin with and then he had a very loud voice with several different notes in it not to mention his brown streaks which made him a proud bird indeed and i think the other crows took him at his own price as foolish creatures are apt to do and thought him very wonderful though he was really only a mongrel now the goose his father used to pay a visit to the crow colony now and again flying down from the mountains to the dust heap where they lived outside the city gate but he did not stay long because the crows used to feed on offal and dead bodies in fact anything dirty they could find and king goose could not get what he liked to eat well once as he was talking to his sons the young geese they asked him why he was always going away for days at a time why he said i go to see a son of mine that lives somewhere else oh how nice said the geese then he must be our brother do let us bring him here on a visit do father at first the father goose would not let them go for fear of mischief but after a while he was persuaded and gave them very careful directions how to fly and where to go and how to find the place where streaky lived on the top of a tall palm tree that grew out of a dust heap at the city gate so away they flew and away they flew till at last they saw the tall palm tree and on the very top of it a big nest and in the nest a little black crow and our funny friend streaky they said how do you do and told their errand because they meant to go through with it now although they did not much like the look of this ugly bird streaky with his airs and graces mrs crow was very much pleased but streaky looked bored and said ah caw i don't think i can fly all that way it is really too much trouble why did not the governor come to see me instead as usual ma this rude bird called his father the governor you see as he had been brought up among carrion crows his manners were not of the best the young geese began to like him less than ever however they put a good face on it and answered him well streaky if you are as weak as all that we will carry you on a stick these geese were very big strong birds and they thought nothing of carrying streaky so they looked about until they found a strong stick and then each of them took an end in his mouth and streaky perched in the middle they could not say good-bye to mrs crow because their mouths were full of the stick but they made her a nice bow like polite little geese and flew off as for streaky he was far too full of his own importance to say good-bye to his mother or even so much as thank you to the two birds who were so kindly carrying him there he sat on the middle of the stick as proud as punch pluming his feathers and feeling that now all the world would see what a splendid bird he was as they flew over the city streaky looked down and saw the king of the city in a beautiful carriage drawn by four white thoroughbreds driving round the city in great state and grandeur aha thought he that's as it should be but i'm every bit as good as he and in his joy he began to sing a little song which he made up on the spur of the moment and here is his song 
as yonder king goes galloping with his milk-white four in hand streak he has these his pair of geese to carry him over the land the geese were very angry when they heard streaky sing this song but they were very well-bred geese as you must have seen already so they said nothing at all to him then but carried him safely to their home and then they told their father what streaky had said so that he might do as he thought best old king goose was more angry than they were and was very sorry he had left his son to be brought up by a crow who knew no manners so he called streaky and this is what he said streaky you have been very rude to your brothers who are at least as good as you and if you think they are like a pair of horses to be driven about for your pleasure you make a great mistake so the best thing you can do is to fly back to your mother for your manners suit the dust heap better than the mountains i don't know whether streaky was ashamed of what he had said creatures like streaky are very thick-skinned and it takes a great deal to make them ashamed but anyhow he had to go back and this time he must fly by himself for it was hardly likely that his brothers would carry him when he had been so rude he got back a few days later tired and hungry and spent the rest of his days on the dust heap eating carrion what his mother thought of it all i don't know but king goose never went to see him any more the bold beggar there was once a king who was so fond of good eating and drinking that they called him king dainty he often spent as much as a thousand pounds on a single dish which is great wastefulness when you can dine heartily for a shilling he thought that if people could not eat things so nice as his yet they must greatly enjoy seeing him eat them so he fitted up a beautiful tent outside his own door and there he took his meals sitting on a golden throne under a white silk umbrella anybody who liked could see him eat his dinner without charge this was very generous wasn't it a man who had often seen him eat thought he would like a taste of the king's choice food and this is what he did he came running towards the crowd who as usual were watching the king eat his dinner and shouted news 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 now at that time there were no newspapers and no posts and no telegraphs so any one who brought news was sure of instant hearing accordingly the crowd made way for him at once and he ran up to the king looking very much excited and shouting news then he fell down before the king as if he were faint with hunger and gasped poor fellow said the king give him something to eat so they propped him up on a chair and the king fed him out of his own dish and gave him delicious wine to drink the man made a hearty meal i can tell you they thought he would never finish but he did finish at last after an hour or two then the king said to him now my good fellow let us hear your news the news is your majesty said the man that an hour ago i was hungry and now i am not all the people looked shocked at his impertinence but the king only laughed and said that news is true of most of us every day of our lives well you are a bold fellow this time you may go free but i advise you not to try it again the man bowed low and went away happy in the success of his trick i don't know whether the king spent less money upon his dinner after that but i am quite sure that no one else got a meal at his table in the same way the jackal would a wooing go once upon a time there was a family of lions that lived in the himalaya mountains in a golden cave they were three brothers and one sister nearby was a silver mountain with a crystal cave and in this crystal cave lived a jackal the young lions used to be out all day hunting while their sister kept everything neat and tidy at home when they caught anything they used to keep a bit for her because they were not greedy lions and they thought that if she did the work at home she deserved some of the game they got abroad now this jackal fell violently in love with the young lioness she was very beautiful with soft brown fur and large soft eyes and fine whiskers and he did not stop to think what a mongrel cur a jackal looks beside a lion how small and sneaking and snarling 
so that it was the height of impertinence even to think of such a thing. He did think of it, and more he actually proposed to the lioness. You shall hear how he did it. He had the sense to wait until the three brothers had gone out hunting for food, and then he came and tapped on the rock at the mouth of the golden cave. The lioness looked out, and very much surprised was the lioness to see the jackal there. She knew him by sight, of course, as a neighbor, and, indeed, when he was in his crystal cave, you could always see him perched up in the air as it might be, for you can see through crystal like glass, and it looked just as if there were nothing there. But they were not on visiting terms, so the lioness was surprised to see him come tapping at her door. She gave him a distant bow and waited. "'Beautiful lioness!' said he. "'I love you. How much we are alike. You have four feet, and so have I. Clearly we are made for one another. Will you marry me? We shall be happy together.' This offer so astonished the lioness that she could say nothing. She hated the vile creature, vilest of all creatures. That he should dare to address himself to a royal lioness, a scavenger to a queen? The very thought of the insult made her furious. She resolved that after such a thing as that had spoken to her, she might just as well die, either by holding her breath or by starving herself. As these thoughts passed through her mind, the jackal was waiting for his answer, but no answer he got. This seemed a pretty broad hint that he was not wanted there, so he went home again, very woe-begone, with his tail between his legs, and lay down in his crystal cave in much misery. By and by the eldest brother of the lioness came home again with a fine fat deer which he had killed. "'Here, sister,' he called out, "'have a bit.' She put on a very gloomy air. "'No,' she said, "'I think I shall have to die.' "'Why, what on earth is the matter?' asked he. "'A nasty, dirty jackal came and wanted to marry me.' "'The brute,' said her brother. "'Where is he?' "'Can't you see him lying up in the sky? "'You know, the crystal was transparent, "'and as she had never been there, "'she could not tell he was really in a cave.' off galloped the young lion furious with rage and when he got near the place where the jackal was lying in his crystal cave he leaped at him when a crack went his skull against the wall of crystal and down fell the lion dead just as the lioness was getting anxious about her eldest brother the second came in she told him the same tale though she was beginning to be sorry that she was going to die he had not hurt her, after all, and how nice the meat smelt. But the second lion did not give her much time to think. He growled, and off he went, leaped into the air, cracked his crown against the wall of crystal, and fell down dead beside his brother. Now, when the third brother came in, the lioness was quite sure she didn't mean to die. However, she looked as gloomy as ever, and told her brother what had happened. He had better go out and see what was become of the other two. Surely two lions were a match for any jackal. Still, there he was, as before, up in the air. "'Up in the air?' said the youngest brother, who was cleverer than all the rest put together. "'Stuff and nonsense! Now, let me think. There must be something for him to lie upon, and yet you can see through it.' He scratched his head with one paw, and looked wise. I have it. Crystal, of course, or glass, that's what it is. So up he jumped, and when he got near the crystal cave, there were his two brothers, dead, with their skulls cracked right across like a teacup. He sat down again and scratched his head with the other paw. Hmm, it looks as though it may be difficult to get at this jackal. However, I'll try kindness first. Jackie, Jackie, dear, he called out. Now you must know that lions have a very loud voice, and if you have heard them talking in the zoo, you will know that even when they want to coax and purr, they are enough to frighten you. And so the poor jackal, who after all was not so bad as the proud lioness made out, when he heard the lion coaxing him down, thought, what an awful roar! His heart was beating very hard before, 
but this time it gave such a leap that something went snap, and the jackal was dead too. Then the lion looked up and saw that the jackal was dead, so he buried his brothers and went and told his sister all about it. You might expect her to be sorry that her two brave brothers were dead, all because she held her nose so high in the air. But not a bit of it. She was quite satisfied, so long as one was left to catch food for her. So she lived all the rest of her life in the golden cave, but I never heard that any other animal asked her to marry him. THE LION AND THE BOAR Once upon a time there was a lion who lived in the mountains, and he used to drink water out of a beautiful lake. It so happened that as he was drinking there one day he saw a boar feeding over on the opposite bank. Now he had just eaten a leg of elephant and was not hungry, but he made a note of that boar, thinking to himself what a nice meal the boar would make some other day. So after drinking his fill he crawled quietly away through the bushes, hoping that the boar would not see him. But the boar had sharp eyes and did see him. Hello, he said to himself, yon lion is afraid of me, that's clear. Ah, well, he need not think to get off so easy. If he wants to go, he must fight me first. He puffed his chest out very big and rubbed his tusks against a tree, and then he called out, Stay, stay, run away, let us have a fight today. You have four feet, so have I. If you fail, you can but try. The lion could hardly believe his ears. What, a boar challenge him to fight? He could break a boar's back with a tap of his paw. Still, he hid his astonishment at this impertinent boar, and said only, uh, Please, Mr. Boar, let me off today, as I'm rather tired. I have just been wrestling with a fox. But if you like, I will meet you here this day week, and then we can fight it out between us. He said this so humbly that the boar became haughtier than ever. Oh, well, very well, said he. It shall never be said I took a mean advantage of any one. This day week, then. Good day to you. When he got home, his friends hardly knew him. Every bristle on his back was standing up straight. His little greedy eyes were gleaming. He ran into the house, knocking over the pots and pans, snarling at his wife, and making himself very disagreeable indeed. At last the other boars protested and said they would not stand it any longer. Ho, ho, says he, you defy a boar that has killed a lion. Come on, then. And very fierce indeed he looked. Killed a lion? They did open their eyes. Where is the lion you have killed? asked a pretty little sow, full of curiosity. Well, I haven't exactly killed him yet, said the boar rather unwillingly. He is coming to be killed this day week. What on earth do you mean? his friends asked. He told them the story, but he did not feel quite so bold now as he had felt before. And when he finished he felt worse than ever for one and all they set up such a weeping and wailing that the whole forest resounded with it. "'Oh, dear! Oh, dear!' they cried. "'You'll be the death of us! Kill a lion! Why, he will crunch you up in a trice, and then he'll come here, and we are all dead boars!' By this time the poor little boar had lost all his conceit. You see, he was an ignorant boar, and did not know at all what the strength of a lion is so his heart was down in his toes, and all he wanted now was some way out of the mischief. Nobody could think of a way, until one very old and wise boar advised him to roll in the mud till he was very dirty, because lions are clean beasts and do not like dirt. So every day he rolled and wallowed in the dirtiest places he could find, and by the appointed time he was like a big cake of dirt. So when he came to the lake where he was to meet the lion, the wind took a whiff of him to the lion, and the lion gave a jump, and snuffed, and sneezed, and swished his tail, and cried out, Get to leeward, get to leeward! Here's a pretty trick. Well, you have saved your life. I would not touch you with a pair of tongs now. And in great disgust he went away, saying, as he went, this little rhyme, Dirty boar, I want no more, you're safe from being eaten. 
If you would fight, I yield me quite, and own that I am beaten. You may be sure that our friend the boar did not wait any longer, but scampered off home. But when he got there, I am sorry to say, he told all his friends that he had beaten the lion, and the lion had run away. He certainly had beaten the lion in one way, but not in a fair fight. So it was rather mean to pretend he had. However, nobody believed him, and the colony of boars thought the best thing they could do was to get away from that place as fast as their four legs could carry them. If he is beaten, said they with a wink, still, after all, he is a lion. THE GOBLIN CITY Long, long ago, in the island of Ceylon, there was a large city full of nothing but goblins. They were all she-goblins, too, and if they wanted husbands, they used to get hold of travelers and force them to marry, and afterwards, when they were tired of their husbands, they gobbled them up. One day a ship was wrecked upon the coast near the goblin city, and five hundred sailors were cast ashore. The she-goblins came down to the seashore and brought food and dry clothes for the sailors and invited them to come into the city. There was nobody else there at all, but for fear that the sailors should be frightened away, the goblins, by their magic power, made shapes of people appear all around, so that there seemed to be men ploughing in the fields, or shepherds tending their sheep, and huntsmen with hounds, and all the sights of the quiet country life. So when the sailors looked round and saw everything as usual, they felt quite secure, although, as you know, it was all a sham. The end of it was that they persuaded the sailors to marry them, telling them that their own husbands had gone to sea in a ship, and had been gone these three years, so that they must be drowned and lost forever. But really, as you know, they had served others in just the same way, and their last batch of husbands were then in prison, waiting to be eaten. In the middle of the night, when the men were all asleep, the she-goblins rose up, put on their hats, and hurried down to the prison. There they killed a few men, and gnawed their flesh, and ate them up, and after this orgy they went home again. It so happened that the captain of the sailors woke up before his wife came home, and not seeing her there, he watched. By and by, in she came. He pretended to be asleep and looked out of the tail of his eye. She was still munching and crunching, and as she munched she muttered, "'Man's meat, man's meat, that's what goblins like to eat.' She said it over and over again, then lay down, and soon she was snoring loudly. The captain was horribly frightened to find he had married a goblin. What was he to do? They could not fight with goblins, and they were in the goblin's power." If they had a ship, they might have sailed away, because goblins hate the water worse than a cat, but their ship was gone. He could think of nothing. However, next morning he found a chance of telling his mates what he had discovered. Some of them believed him, and some said he must have been dreaming. They were sure their wives would not do such a thing. Those who believed him agreed that they would look out for a chance of escape. But there was a kind of fairy who hated those goblins, and she determined to save the men. So she told her flying horse to go and carry them away, and accordingly, as the men were out for a walk next day, the captain saw in the air a beautiful horse with large white and gold wings. The horse fluttered down and hovered just above them, crying out in a human voice, "'Who wants to go home? Who wants to go home? Who wants to go home?' i do i do called the sailors climb up then said the horse dropping within reach so one climbed up and then another and another and although the horse looked no bigger than any other horse there was room for everybody on his back i think that somehow when they got up the fairy made them shrink small till they were no bigger than so many ants and thus there was plenty of room for all when all who wanted to go had got up on his back, away flew the beautiful horse and took them safely home. As for those who remained behind, that very night the goblins set upon them and mangled them and munched them to mincemeat. Lacknose 
there was once a gardener who had no nose and he had a very nice garden full of beautiful flowers roses and pinks and lilies and violets and all the prettiest flowers you can imagine three little boys thought they would like a bunch of flowers but they did not know how to get it so one of them went into the garden and said good morning mr lacknose good morning boy said the gardener the boy thought the best thing he could do was to flatter the old fellow so he had made up a verse of poetry that he thought very pretty and he said to the gardener cut and cut and cut again hair and whiskers grow amain and your nose will grow like these give me a little posy please the gardener knew very well that his nose would not grow again like his whiskers and he thought the little boy rather rude to mention it so he became angry go away said he and get your posy somewhere else the boy went away disappointed but the second boy thought he would try his luck too perhaps the first boy had not spoken nicely and he made a verse of poetry too which he thought would just suit the old gardener so in he came with good morning mr lacknose good morning boy said the old man and what do you want then the boy put on a coaxing smile and said in the autumn seeds are sown and ere long they're fully grown may your nose sprout up like these give me a little posy please there he thought the old fellow will like that because he is a gardener but not a bit of it the gardener saw through his trick and was angrier than ever be off said he or i'll be after you with a stick plant a nose indeed you had better go somewhere and learn manners before you ask for my flowers so the second boy went away faster than the first but the third boy was an honest little boy and knew that there is nothing like the truth so he determined to try what truth could do he walked modestly into the garden and said good morning sir what another of em growled the gardener to himself another pack of lies i suppose he would hardly look at the boy but the boy nothing daunted repeated his verse babbling fools to think that they could get a posy in this way say they yes or say they no noses cut no more will grow see i ask you honestly give a posy sir to me the gardener was so pleased to find a straightforward and honest little boy that he took his scissors and cut a most beautiful bunch of flowers which he gave the boy with a smile the boy said oh, thank you sir very much and went away delighted the king's lesson once upon a time there lived a very good king whose name was godfrey of course when a man is king everybody is ready to call him good but this king really was good he used to hold courts of justice for people to come to when they had a quarrel and he decided all the cases so wisely that nobody durst bring an unjust cause before him so after a while the result was that the courts became empty all the rustle and bustle was quiet the wigs and gowns were hung up on pegs and as dusty as dusty could be and nobody had any quarrels at all what a blessing thought king godfrey to himself now we have a little peace and they say it's all my doing i wonder if i am really as good as people make me out suppose i try to see no sooner said than done with this king he asked one and he asked another he begged and prayed them to tell him of his faults so that he might mend them but no they said they really could not tell him of his faults when he had none to tell of he tried in the palace he tried in the city high and low to and fro it was just the same all praise and no blame well upon my word thought the king i had no idea i was such a good fellow still who knows what they say behind my back happy thought i'll disguise myself and that will soon show me the truth so he dressed himself like a traveller and got a carriage and pair and drove all over the country asking everybody what they thought of the king wonder of wonders they said the same behind his back as they did to his face that must have been a very nice country to live in but i am sure i cannot tell where it is 
now in such a strange country as that strange things will happen and so it turned out that as our king was driving along he came to a narrow lane sunk between two steep banks and with only just room for the carriage and right in the middle of this lane another carriage met him there they stood both of them and neither would budge our king did not know who was in that carriage but i will tell you who it was this was the king of the next country who was also a good king as a king's go though not so good as the first and he had got the same idea into his head that he would wander about in disguise and find out what people thought of him everybody had a good word for him too it seems and if he found no one to pick faults in him before here was one now as you shall see get out of the way said the driver of the other carriage get out of the way yourself said king godfrey's man i have a king inside said he you see he knew who the disguised traveller was and he thought there was no need to hide it now when it might save him trouble if you have one king i have another said the other man and imagine how astonished king godfrey's coachman was to hear that oh dear oh dear he said what is to be done both kings how old is your king he added suddenly hoping you see that the younger might be willing to give way fifty fifty so is mine and how rich is he but it turned out they were just the same in that point and though he cudgelled his brains to find out some difference there seemed to be none their kingdoms were exactly the same size with exactly the same number of people in them and their ancestors had been just as brave and glorious in peace or war in fact they were as like as two peas in a pod all this time the horses were champing their bits and pawing the ground as if they would like to jump over each other's heads and i dare say the kings were getting impatient too though they were much too dignified to say anything and there they might have stayed till doomsday but that king godfrey's coachman hit on a fine idea he suggested that perhaps one of them was a better king than the other what were his master's virtues would the other coachman kindly tell him the other coachman had his answer already in poetry too and this it was rough to the rough my mighty king the mild with mildness sways masters the good by goodness and the bad with badness pays give place give place o driver such are this monarch's ways mm, said king godfrey's driver tit for tat is all very well but i shouldn't call it virtue to pay out a bad man in his own coin oh well says the other in a huff you can call it vice if you like and i should be very glad to hear all your king's virtues if you laugh at mine certainly said king godfrey's coachman and not to be beaten he did his answer into poetry like the other he conquers wrath by mildness the bad with goodness sways by gifts the miser vanquishes and lies with truth repays give place give place o driver such are this monarch's ways then the other man felt he had met his match i can't cap that said he your master is better than mine and the new king who had not said a word all this time thought it was time to be moving perhaps he had been asleep anyhow he was not at all angry with his coachman but out he got and they let the horses loose and pulled the carriage up on the slope to let king godfrey pass by but king godfrey before he went on gave the other king a little good advice which the king promised to take for in that strange country people used to follow good advice sometimes and then they said good-bye and both went back home again and both of them ruled their countries well until they died the other king we may be sure was all the better for that lesson and i hope godfrey did not become conceited in that strange country as he would have been if he lived here with us end of part four end of the giant crab and other tales from old india retold by w h d rouse